with more cut content from any news. What happened between Subaru, Satala, and the other witches? This is actually the first core finale because obviously we're watching ReZero all in one go. So it seems to me like nothing special should be happening. But if you take into context of like it being a core one finale, the episode was insane. A therapy session with Satala and then <laughs> relapse with Roswell. There was quite a bit to unpack for the final episode of ReZero. Yeah. So much so that I couldn't even fit it all into a single video. A lot of the events from the final Witches Tea Party were streamlined for the sake of getting to a reasonable point to end the season. But by doing that, we missed out on a lot of the interesting interactions from each of the witches. Such as? Plus a very significant plot point about Satella that wasn't included in the anime. Mm. So let's take a look at this and more and see what exactly the finale didn't include from the novels. Let's go! Also, since a lot of you have been asking, if you're looking for a place to read the novels, then you can continue the story by using Bookwalker. Since we've partnered together, you can use code AMU to get $5 off, off your wow, first Wow, guys, go today. get it. Go that get way it. you can get a discount and continue the ReZero story from Volume 13. So, if you're interested, then the link to that will be down in the description below. Alright. let's begin. Episode 38, The Sounds That Make You Want to Cry. Covering Chapters 1 to 2 of Volume 13 of the Light Novel. The Witch of Envy's sudden appearance was certainly something surprising. But Pow. what Subaru found to be even more surprising was the lack of action from any of the other witches. They were fine. He always believed that the other six, if together, would be able to resist her. I thought they'd be upset. Tifon was pretty happy. Echidna was the most mad. Probably because she wants Subaru for himself, but... It's seemingly like... Whatever Satala did 400 years ago and killed all the different witches... Are they not taking it personally? Maybe they understand why it had to be done? I'm not sure other six if together would be able to resist her. Yet, not a single one made a move to try to avenge themselves. Because they simply can't. Because that's how powerful she is. Or, we're misunderstanding everything and there actually isn't a grudge. They simply stood in place as the Witch of Envy made her approach. Hmm. Now, unlike in the anime, the first person to do anything was actually Minerva. Which was pretty shocking considering that Minerva was the weakest witch out of all of them. Oh shit! <laughs> we got a tier list! <laughs> Alright, literally doesn't do damage. Uh, Minerva, she can seemingly only heal. I thought that maybe she'd be able to do something to, I don't know, do the opposite of healing, but no. Can kill you? Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. Pretty strong T-Phone. Godlike. And then we have Reinhardt here, <laughs> which is above Godlike. It was said that Sekhmet drew the Great Dragon beyond the waterfall, right? And, like, she can take on all the other witches combined, excluding Satala. And Satala is at Reinhardt level because she consumed every other witch to get that power, right? I'm not sure how that happens, but I'd imagine she's super powerful and she had the power to ravage half the world by consuming the other witches and somehow powering up. Unlike the others, she simply isn't capable of directly attacking anyone. Her physical attacks have and always will end up turning into healing. So, combat wasn't really Minerva's strong point. What about this shit, though? She can clearly do environmental damage. She can clearly destroy things, inanimate object. But if it's like a living thing, organic substance, I don't know how this rule works, she heals it. That, however, didn't stop her from asking if this was the envy that she knew. Minerva wanted to know if the shadow standing in front of her could be trusted. Hmm. But it never- What does that mean? Is this the you I know? really Minerva's strong point. That, however, didn't stop her from asking if this was the envy that she knew. Hmm. Minerva wanted to know if the shadow standing in front of her could be trusted. Because the Minerva... Because the Satala that Minerva is referring to is the one that she is fond of? There's two separate Satala? That's an interesting line. The one that I know, can I trust you, implies that there is a version of Satala that Minerva can trust. And there's a virgin that she can't. So now there's the possibility of two Satalas? What is, what's going on? But it never answered. Instead, the Witch of Envy just stood there as if completely defenseless. Okay. It made Subaru wonder even more why the six witches with all their authorities, power, and magic didn't just try to kill her right there. Mm -hmm. Surely they must be holding some sort of grudge against the one who- Hey, have we seen authority of grudge? Sorry. Have, have we seen Authority of Greed? Every other witch, we've seen kind of their powers, right? What, what is the Authority of Greed? 
Is this entire place the authority of greed? Her simple memory seeking skills? Because like... Every one of them, I think we've seen their powers. Maybe it's intentional that they're they're hiding that part. Who ended their lives. But that was a question to which only Echidna could answer. She said that if the six of them were to gang up and somehow manage to beat Envy, then that would present an opportunity for Sekhmet or Thiefon. You see, hmm. attacking Envy would also mean to expose your back to the others. And if Echidna was to expose her back to Sekhmet or Tifon, then the odds of her surviving at the end were honestly not very good. That wasn't Sekhmet all OP. there was to it, though. There was an even more important additional factor that went to make the witches hesitate. One that wasn't even implied in the anime. Because of its level of significance, it leads me to believe that it's information that will likely come up later. Hmm? It's to it, though. There was an eat if a Wait. kidna was to expose her back to Sekhmet or Tifon, then we're talking about ganging up and other people being liable for different attacks, okay? But the odds of her surviving at the end were honestly not very okay. Good. But 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 that wasn't all there was to it, though. Okay. There was an even more important additional factor that went to make the witches hesitate, one that wasn't preventing from attacking Satala, right? Why? And even implied in the anime. Okay. Because of its level of significance, it leads me to believe that it's information that will likely come up later. Are we gonna get it? <laughs> it's cut cut content. The cut content is not being covered because Anius is assuming it's gonna happen in the next core, but it never even happened. Is he gonna explain it? So, if you don't want to know what it is, then- I wanna know it. It's never mentioned in the anime. I mean, shit, if it's not gonna show up, I think it's essential then. Feel free to skip ahead to the- Like, if- if- if Arc- Five, like this shit's not gonna be handled in arc five, right? So like there's no point. It's it's the enemy never covered it. It's lost content. We gotta cover it. Following timestamp. But anyway, it was after Echidna's answer that Daphne and Carmilla chimed in to elaborate. Yes, the witches did hold a grudge against Envy. That much was an undeniable fact. This, however, was a very different situation. Why? You see, Carmilla and the others didn't have a grudge against the girls standing in front of them. Why? At least they didn't think so. According to Daphne, whether they'd attack or not was dependent on whether the girl in front of them was Satella or Envy. Okay, so that was exactly what Minerva said. Minerva literally was like, are you the one that I know? Can I trust you? The distinction between the two, two separate I identities between the person named Satella and the Witch of Envy. Now, because like, so far, what's been happening? We have been understanding about this folklore, this myth. It's not a myth, it happened through books and different people's interpretation of the story. But history is written by those who win. And sometimes the real truth are not ever explained. The people of Lugunica and everyone else assume Satala and Witch of Envy to be the same thing. But now it seems like Satala is a separate entity. And the being that consumed all the other witches and turned into the Witch of Envy that ravaged half the earth, that's like a separate being. Two separate entities, Satala and Witch of Envy. It's dependent on whether the girl in front of them was Satella or Envy. Hmm. And if they didn't know who it was, then they would just do nothing at all. Interesting. So that in its own right was very interesting to know. Everything comes down to whether it's Tella Tella or Jealousy who came. I think this is supposed to be like a nickname, right? So, all right. Now we know even more mysteries. <laughs> this isn't really more answers, though. We got even more questions! Alright, now we know that Satala and Witch of Envy are two separate beings, but why? I thought you said Satala killed all the other witches, but the Witch of Envy did it. But aren't they the same person? I don't know anymore. They're separate people. Maybe... The B... Sat the theory is... The seal kind of, I don't know, because like, where the fuck is she chilling? So the Witch of Envy seal, but Satala's just roaming around? The flesh was never broken. Let's break down the theory. What was it again? A long time ago, Satala probably had a man that resembles Subaru. Maybe it even was him from a future. I don't fucking know how that works, but I'm going to assume that her lover was a person that resembles Subaru or was Subaru. And then what happened? Something fucked up happened in the world. He died. And then she had the motive to seek out revenge on the world by consuming other witches. At that point, maybe Satala then evolved into what's known as the Witch of Envy, who loses all sight of things and just chaotically destroyed everything. So maybe it's not two separate people, but it's still the same person. It's just that in that 
a wrath-like state where she took everyone and ravaged the earth. That's what they refer to as Witch of Envy. But the satellite they remember, which is the chill one that didn't kill before, is different? I, I, I don't know. If we assume that they are in in indeed two separate beings, then what? Satala has been fraudulently framed, and the Witch of Envy is the actual being that was sealed by the hero, the sage, and the dragon. But the flesh was never destroyed. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it's, it's weird. But now, there is more schizo questions to ask of, are they the same person as just two different mindsets of when they consumed and when they didn't? Or is it truly two separate living beings? I don't know. But uh, interesting, we'll definitely remember that. But what was even more interesting was the fact that Daphne ended her statement by saying that this was something that a sage candidate should have known. What? A statement... A sage candidate? What the fuck is a sage candidate? More lore. All, all I know is Flugel is most likely the wise man referred to the sage, and we know the, the Flugel tree, but... What? A sage candidate? Even more interesting was the fact that Daphne ended her statement by saying that this was something that a sage candidate should have known. Alright. A statement that probably shouldn't have been said at all. Who, who's the sage candidate right now? Should, should have known who Satala or Witch of Envy is? But they intentionally hid the fact? What, what's the implication here? Because there's no sage candidate in this current place. Are you implying there's a sage candidate in the room? You're not, right? Then why would you pose that question? Reason being that the moment she did, Sekhmet began to scold her. Huh? This wasn't something that Subaru was supposed to know yet. Huh? And apparently Are we? neither were we. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, a sage has wisdom, right? A sage is very wise. Subaru... He's not really that wise, but remember the forbidden Appa theory? What is the, what is the forbidden knowledge that we gained in exchange for the fruit? The different timeline memories, right? By having those knowledge, Subaru could seem like a sage, even though he's not a genius, right? It seems like Subaru knows everything that's going to happen. One could interpret that as a sage, and Subaru is indeed the sage candidate. Now, let's take this and think about Lugal. Has the past sages just been geniuses? Or were they also frauds with regression power? Did the past sage also have the authority of envy and use return by death to figure out different knowledge? How does that work? I, I don't know. In any case, the essence of what they were trying to say was that they weren't mad at Satella. They only held a grudge towards the Witch of Envy. Alright, this is crazy shit. This, this is some fucking crazy shit right now. So what do we have so far? Potential for two entities, two separate entities, right? It's, it, it, it could still be just Satala, but just that the Witch of Envy is referred to the person that consumed all six switches and then ravaged the Earth, or they are indeed two separate entities, I don't know. We know that Subaru is a sage candidate. There could be multiple sage candidates, but we don't know that information just yet because I guess enough time hasn't passed yet. Maybe in future arcs, Subaru will become knowledgeable enough to figure out the distinction between a Witch of Envy and Satala. And now what? I don't know. I guess the comments that Satala is saying, one day you must come and find me and kill me, also kind of makes sense because the kill me is probably referring to the Witch of Envy and not really Satala. Seems like Satala is not a bad person. It's just the Witch of Envy. So... Was it Witch of Envy that showed up and fucked us up then? In the episode when we cheated on Satala with Echidna? And we came out and she just consumed everything? Was that the Witch of Envy? Or was that Satala? I don't know! <laughs> I still don't know how about the seal! I don't know! Because the Witch of Envy at that point consumed us. And in the darkness, then the true Satala was there. Maybe the true Satala is like hidden, locked away. In this Witch of Envy. And then the dark... And, and within the Shadow Garden frame, when, when we... The, 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 the crying Satala that we saw, the one we wiped the tears away and said, I'll save you. That is the true Satala, hidden deep within the Witch of Envy, which did consume us. Does that make sense? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> don't get me wrong, though. Satala and the Witch of Envy are, in fact, the same person. <laughs> Fuck you. Should have just fucking... Played that section. That was how the world remembered them. Yeah, that's the how the world remembers. But we're getting told from the perspective of the world. That might not be the actual truth. 
But what wasn't recorded into history was the fact that Satella had a type of personality disorder. She bipolar? Okay, wait. <laughs> okay. In Satella exists as two witches. Satella and the Witch of Envy. She, she's just a crazy bitch. And okay, all right. Bipolar. Not a standard split personality like how you or I tend to understand them, though. But how? This was more of a mental abnormality that was unique to witches. What? Satella had absorbed a witch factor that wasn't entirely compatible with her. Why would she absorb a witch factor that's incompatible? I assume... I don't even know how witch factors work. I thought witch factors are specific to archbishops. But witches assume... How does... Because right now, Subaru has the authority of sloth. Witch factor. Sloth. Segment. Use their power. It's not like one person has or the other. Are there multiple witch factors? How does that shit work? This caused for an anomaly to occur within Satella's mind, which in turn created the personality of the Witch of Envy. Okay. Two very distinct personas. Some witch factor incompatible with Satella. For whatever reason, she had to take it. I don't know the reason, but that's the reason for two separate personalities and only one of which was ever recorded into history so the witches didn't know whether the person in front of them was satella or the witch of envy the that fuck? was why they couldn't attack her the risk for echidna was also far too great plus it didn't help that she was the only witch that still had a desire to live you see all the others had already accepted their deaths none of them saw the need to stay alive as lingering souls to them, it was better to die while having lived according to their single belief than struggle to keep going. Hmm. That was the nature of a witch. So it wasn't really all that bad if they disappeared along with Echidna's soul, which actually would have been what would happen if Echidna lost in battle. Damn. Echidna's gone, everyone's gone. That's kind of sad. I don't want the witches to go away. They're great content. They have great designs too. I, now they're... I, I don't know how they're going to incorporate the witches in the future arcs, but maybe we'll never meet them again after this. But I've enjoyed them, and they've given us so much knowledge. Anyway, Subaru initially showed a lot of hesitation when it came to the approaching shadow. He did have quite a few questions that he wanted answers to. But Minerva made it clear that the only way he was going to get them was by asking Satella directly. She personally felt that if Subaru couldn't even talk to someone who made such an effort to see him and him alone, then, then you're a baby. Subaru wasn't the man that she thought he was. You're a pussy, even Subaru. So, Subaru wasn't about to do this just because Minerva said to. But that wasn't really helping the fact that the situation would stay as a stalemate until Subaru did do something. With the way it was, the fate of both himself and the witches now depended on the weakest and most foolish person among them. This was because Echidna's dream world was only kept in check by the witches who coexisted with each other. What do you mean? It was a balance carefully established between them and them alone. But that equilibrium was now in danger because of the appearance of this outsider. An outsider whose focus was set solely on Subaru, making him the only person capable of resolving this situation. Okay. So, not wanting to deal with any- I still don't know how the fuck she appeared here. Apparently she broke a bunch of barriers to get in here. I still don't know how that seal works. I'm still gonna assume it's a weakened seal. We know that Satala has her body undestroyed. Is this, but this is not, it's, a, it's like an ethereal dreamlike land though. So this is a soul version showing up. Any of this, Subaru first checked to see if Echidna would let him leave. Of course, her curiosity made her want to witness this encounter all the way to its end. Not to mention that since she just got dumped, she actually didn't mind getting to see another witch get that same treatment. <laughs> I never really took that shit personally. Wanted to see Satala get dumped. So, with seemingly no options left, Subaru finally began to approach the Witch of Envy. The closer he got, the more his instincts were telling him to avert his eyes. It wasn't a reaction predicated out of fear, though. It was more because this was something that Subaru didn't want to see. As Echidna herself likes to put it, everyone would prefer to avert their eyes from their most unsightly delusions. If you cannot see her face, the issue lies within your own mind. I mean, she, like, have you seen season one? Have you seen the things that he had to go through and how traumatized we'd actually be? You blame the guy? It was advice that urged Subaru to finally shift his head upward. And when he did, he found that it was neither hatred nor disgust that he felt towards this witch. What do you feel? No, that would have been much too easy. Instead, what he felt was a feeling of relief. 
reasons for which I'm sure you already know why. It's also the same reason that he couldn't stand to hear this person say, I love you. These were words that Ugh. he simply couldn't accept from her. Although they brought comfort to his soul, there was too much of a contradiction coming from his mind to allow that comfort to remain. Not only that, but the aura of obsession Subaru felt from the Witch of Envy now rivaled that of all the emotions that helped to keep him moving forward. It made Subaru feel as if all the memories he'd made and relationships he'd built were now at risk of being stripped away. Because That's that just how that much compulsion the witch seemed to have over him. So, out of the fear of that actually happening, Subaru had his outburst like how we saw in the anime, leading Minerva to express her grievances with it. She really didn't like Subaru's mentality of everything being okay simply because he was the only one who had to suffer. It was a mindset that she found to be unfair to the people around him. It was kind of... I'm not sure if it's... Simply because of this arc being so long and us being stuck in this current situation over and over. A Subaru has been more annoying than season one to me. Am I crazy or do you guys feel the same way too? Yes, I think the lows are way lower in arc three when Subaru fucked up. But it's this constant yelling and screaming and crying. Which makes sense, but because due to the anime structure, everything just being in the sanctuary, the entire time of him just fucking crying and crying, I'm like, I get it. The difference in the season one was that there is brief moments, but he comes back relatively fast. This entire arc, it's, we're 13 separate episodes in. We're 13 episodes in and there, it's just like constant, just fucking yelling, screaming and crying. And I get the dialogue, but I have to really think about it. But again, I told you, the lows are lows. People hate Season 1 Subaru because they see the low points. I, it's, I agree the low points are way lower. But like, Season 2 all throughout, it's just every episode, it's just like, Jesus Christ, brother. Especially her. And when, it, when Minerva like called him out for this shit, I was like, true. All the other witches calling him out was like, very true. Inner monologue cut? I mean, that's just the fucking anime skill issue, right? Where it's just like, he says all this shit and it's just like, where the fuck is this coming from? And then I have to fucking dissect all the different actions and theorize why he could be feeling that way. But the monologue that got cut would explain exactly why he's doing that way. This was because this was a- There has been no highs. Exactly. The entirety of like, we're, we're on episode 13 right now. There has not been a single moment of triumphant moments yet. It's just looping fail and fail. And I don't even blame him for the failures. The challenges that we're facing right now are fucking impossible. I get it. But it's just like every episode, he's just screaming, and I'm like, oh, Jesus fucking Christ. Way of living that directly opposed her own. As a witch who vehemently opposes conflict, her wrath has always been intended to heal. So if she sees any form of harm being done, then she will always step in to fix it. No self-harm self -harm allowed. Included. That's why Subaru's disregard for his own life was something she simply couldn't allow. It went against everything that she stood for. That much was understandable. But what made Subaru lash out was her last comment about- Now you guys are not fucking getting it. I need to draw you a fucking picture for you guys to understand. You're not getting it, bro. None of you are fucking getting it. Here's the problem with season two, bro. Come on, Microsoft Paint. Fucking work. Alright, you ready for this shit? Come on. Christ, come on. Season one is like this. Season one, in terms of like the highs and lows, right? Here's arc one. You ready? This is arc one right now. Arc one, it's like, let me draw this with the brush. Arc 1 is like this. This is the highs and this is the lows, okay? This is the lows. Come on, man. I need a better brush than that. Arc 1 felt like... Hmm? And then we kind of fuck up, right? This is, this is like first run and we're really affectionate with S Satala or, you know, uh, Emilia. And then there's a little bit of drop as we call her a slur in the street. But then we're kind of fucking around with Elsa, low point. But then Reinhardt saves us and the high point is there and we're all happy. We're all fucking happy. Arc 2 is like, 
Mm, but oh no, Rem thinks we're suspicious. We're really suspicious. We're really, we're fucking up. We're fucking up. We're fucking up. We're trying way too hard. Rem saves us. Everything is good. High point. We end up in high point. Arc three is like we go start off and it's immediately oh shit we fuck up at the melee. Everything is bad. Everything is bad. Rock bottom. Rock bottom. Rock bottom. Episode eighteen. And then the highs are fucking high and then we fucking pop off. Right? Every time we've had something like that. But this arc is just. There's not a single point of triumphant moment yet for 13 fucking episodes. And I understand why. It's long arc. And there's no payoff. And that's why it feels annoying. The lows is not as low, right? The low is not as low as arc 3 when we were, when we were fucking down here. But relatively, compared to the amount of episodes, we, we get back up here. But we have not had a single moment here yet. It's just Subaru just fucking screaming and crying, and I get it. I know why he's doing it. I truly do understand. But it's just been a constant low the entirety of the fucking first quarter of season two. And it is becoming a drag. It's becoming such a fucking drag. And it makes me, like, start to hate this character more than a situation where I know he fucked up in arc three. He was down here. But we quickly picked ourselves up and got up here. It's just... This is the nature of arc two and why I think that a lot of people, pro people don't even like season two because of how quote unquote slow it is. And I, I understand. If we're talking about actual core content of ReZero, the amount of lore we're getting is on another level. But if you're talking about keeping the audience engaged and delivering them just bite pieces of like wins here and there and, and having something pay off, like that hasn't happened yet. And I get why people are like, not liking season two compared to season one. It's just one fat arc that is just stalling, but it's necessary, right? It's necessary content. About him being too cruel. To him, the way he was now was simply a natural result of all the events that he's been through. Events that several of the witches undoubtedly had their hands in. Every one of you saying you like season two more than season one, you need to understand that you are literally a fucking outlier. You're like the 0.1% of ReZero enjoyers that are actively watching another dude literally stream on kick after he got banned on Twitch to cover any news fucking ReZero cut content before season 3 happens. Do you think that the majority, like 95% of the average retard watching ReZero does not think like you? They do not care. They want hype shit. They want whale subjugation. They want hype good moments. You guys are literally nitpicking on whether or not Satala said, I love you in a specific way or a different way in two different episodes and comparing it to Theorycraft. You are literally the 0.0001% of ReZero watchers that have this opinion, but the vast majority have the exact opposite. So for them to complain that the way Subaru turned out was unfair or just not right, well, then Subaru felt that the witches had no one to blame but themselves. One of the witches did interject to say that he could at least start to rely on others. But Subaru quickly refuted the idea since he felt he was the only one with the power to do anything. As he was now, he truly believed that his method of trial and error was the only way to make it to the future that he- Those are pretty baseless claims though, in my opinion. I feel like it's pretty split. And you know what? I'll say the exact same thing to you. You are also saying some baseless claims in my opinion. I feel like it's not. See how easy that is? You are a simple consumer. I create content and try to get the actual numbers and analysis. I see data at a larger scale. You have your opinions. I have statistics. And on top of that, I have public perception. I think that... What people say about season two makes a lot of sense if you think about from the perspective of an average watcher, but you cannot see from that lens. He desired. This was the one and only thing that he found himself to be in agreement with the Witch of Greed. So while still in a fit of rage, Subaru then went on to confront the Witch of Envy directly. He wanted to apologize for the time when he said that he was sick of her. Reason being that that wasn't really true to how he actually felt. There was something that Subaru felt the need to show gratitude for. Okay. So, continuing with his aggressive tone, Subaru proceeded to thank the Witch of Envy for one thing and one thing only. I mean, he keeps calling her Witch of Envy here instead of Satala, so is this really the Witch of Envy then? The power to return by death. This was the only thing that he was willing to acknowledge her for. And when he did, 
he began to speak words that came from the deepest parts of his darkest emotions. But while rambling on... Are you seriously asking me right now? Am I the average watcher? I, I, or, or, these are rhetorical questions. Like, you're not that stupid, right? There's nearly 200 fucking videos on ReZero right now. I'm not even done halfway through season two yet. What, what, what is the point you're trying to fucking make right now? I gave you my opinion about the current state of season two compared to season one. I then gave you examples about other people's opinions and explained to you what the graph of why I think people enjoy season one more than season two. And I'm contextualizing why things are. I don't think you understand what I'm saying or you wouldn't ask me these questions because you're trying to give me a gotcha moment to say some other bullshit. Like, what other ReZero reactor out there right now is doing this deep of analysis right now? Can you name another person? And I'm not talking about some fucking psychology bullshit. I'm talking about the actual fucking lore and the content. Like, I don't think you truly understand what I'm saying. I'm contextualizing in a greater scale about the masses' opinions about ReZero and tying it with my own perception of how Season 2 has been. If you've seen my reactions, I'm literally saying every Roswell scene, every time we get it, it's so fucking peak. You don't understand why I'm complaining? So you want me to just glaze this show? You want me to sit here and you want me to tell you that you're a good boy, your opinions are all correct, and you want me to affirm your opinions? The moment... I explained to you how I feel about this character due to the nature of the content being adapted. You then suddenly get all personally hurt and call me out saying, oh, you're not. You're a fucking average monkey watching this shit. <laughs> That's crazy, bro. Remember, I don't have loyalty to this show. I don't have loyalty to any show. I will simply farm what I want. And you can see how much passion and engagement there is to the content. It's that simple. And if you can't see that, like, no, 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 no. You're putting words in my mouth right now. I'm talking and you're typing. I have the fucking resume in chat right now. You're asking rhetorical questions to put me in a gotcha moment. Like, I explained to you how I feel about the current state of season two. I explained to you how I'm feeling about Super based on my own personal opinions. And I contextualize why the greater audience may feel that way. I'm not saying, I'm not saying this is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm explaining to you why things are the way they are. And some people cannot separate this from their own personal like worldview. They genuinely can't. They think that I'm like defending them. They think that like I'm like literally justifying and defending their monkey takes. No, nah, bro. I'm just literally showing you how the world is, and I'm not explaining to you it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm explaining it is what it is. Season 2 is a fucking drag. I love the lore, but do you think the average person is going to enjoy Season 2 more than Season 1? You know what I'm fucking saying? Like, I don't think you guys really understand what I'm saying. Half the times, you just watch me to get your own opinion affirmed, to feel good about yourself. The moment I talk about something in a different context, you don't even know how to fucking understand anymore. And you get upset because you think that I'm like piercing your fucking soul. On and on about how he truly felt, one single word from Satella was enough to stop Subaru right in his tracks. Then this led to the several other words that went to make Subaru more confused than he's ever been before. You see, Ever since he lost Rem, Subaru had forced himself to work alone. He didn't want to have to put anyone else at risk. There was a million. So he forced himself to believe that no one would care what would happen to him. That was the only way that he could build the resolve to fight every single battle by himself. So for someone like Satella to come in and say that he should care more about himself, well, that was pretty, pretty ironic. much her denying his very way of living. She was slowly becoming this poison that was inching its way into Subaru's heart. But it only feels that way because we're just so biased into thinking we need to use return by death. But then again, it's a little bit of a skill issue question too. It's just like, why can't you figure out that you can save yourself too? Well, bitch, it's fucking hard. I can't just do a perfect run every time. I got to keep dying and learning and dying and learning. But there has been moments where we do just rely on dying 
rather than trying to figure out how to do better. So the whole thing here is like, you're not alone and you can save yourself too. One that was exposing each and every single one of his flaws, forcing him to come face to face with all the things that he had tried to bury deep within himself. Now, contrary to what Subaru believed, there were in fact people who could pass judgment over him. And that's exactly what Satella and the other witches were doing here, leading him to break down into tears like how we saw in the anime. When Tifon came to ask who it was that made him sad, she began to list out the names of the witches one by one. This is a very interesting scene because she actually got really mad here, and everyone else got on super guard. ...out the names of the witches one by one. Minerva was the only suspect that she could really disregard though. I mean, her and all the other witches already knew that causing harm to others was impossible for her, which wasn't really something that she enjoyed being known for. So she chimed in to say that even she was capable of hurting others. But the way that she stuttered while saying it and the fact that her face always went pale whenever considering it, well, that was enough to show that Minerva wouldn't even hurt a fly. I mean, I wonder how this power really works. Because again, like, if you look at the ground, like, she is very powerful. I even see her shaking this fucking world. I'm not sure if that's supposed to be like a slice of life moment. But clearly she can't just punch you and you get hurt. But what if you punched the ground and you created a huge landslide? And that hits somebody, right? Rather than direct attacks, just environmental attacks that causes collateral damage onto you. Like, you can do that though, right? Because like this, I clearly see of her doing insane damage onto the ground. Look at the environment. The way that she stuttered while saying it and the fact that her face always went pale whenever considering it, well, that was enough to show that Minerva wouldn't even hurt a fly. As Tifon continued with each of their names, Subaru could sense that the equilibrium existing between the witches was beginning to crumble. Tifon was closely inspecting each of the others to find out who it was that made Subaru cry. No matter who they were, that was punishment needed moment. to be doled out to the person who had sinned. So here was Pride keen on punishing the sinners, while Wrath was trying to make sure that Satella's feelings would be heard. Sloth was observing everyone, waiting Gotta to strike fair. down the first person that would make a move. Gluttony was simply watching for the opportunity where she could satiate her hunger. Then Greed was carefully taking in the encounter, we were, paying like a close wild attention west. so that she could take note of any shifts in the balance of power. And last but not least, Satella was trying to comfort the boy in front of her. She spoke all these words of how Subaru had been this ray of light for her, how he had taken her hand and taught her all about the world. How he had given her all these things that saved her from her loneliness. When? When the fuck did this happen? How are we not asking these questions? And I understand from a storytelling perspective, it makes no sense to get all the answers right now. We're supposed to get a little hints here and there. But it's just crazy to me, in the face of everything that you have questioned, you don't even fucking ask because I guess you're just too depressed and shocked. And yeah, you can make the fucking explanation that he's not in the right mental state. Is he ever in the right fucking mental state? All of which resulted in the manifestation of this undying affection towards him. Why? To her, Subaru had given her everything. When? Of course, Subaru couldn't understand any of this. So ask! He never even met this girl before in his life. So to him, she was no different from Betelgeuse. A person who had simply gone mad with love. This was the conclusion that Subaru had come to. But for some reason he couldn't force himself to feel the same way. Hmm. The memories that Satella was trying to tie Subaru to were already latching themselves onto his heart. The single person that Subaru was supposed to hate the most in this world was now making him feel a way that never should have been possible. It made for an impossible contradiction that Subaru's mind simply couldn't handle. Is this like the subconscious shit? Like the Shadow Garden scene too, there is this like unexplainable love he feels towards her sometimes in the Shadow Garden moments. But like, or is this just simply Satala's powers that override your feelings and are we, are we being gaslit? Is this authentic, genuine feelings? If so, when did they ever happen in the past? Memories just lost? Reincarnation, subconscious memories? I don't know. way that never should have been possible. It made for an impossible contradiction that Subaru's mind simply couldn't handle. So, with nothing left but a desire to escape the current situation, Subaru did the only thing that he possibly could. Now, Subaru dying here bore a lot more risk than dying for real. Remember, dying here essentially meant the death of the mind. 
And the death of the mind had the potential to leave Subaru's body as an empty husk. The soul is so gone. This could have very well led to a permanent end. Now, Minerva's attempt to. I wonder if he ever even thought about that. Because, like, think about it. If you're so suicidal, if you're so depressed, and you know that you can never die, wouldn't have wouldn't an opportunity to get your soul just like dying just occur to you? It does, and he bites his tongue to do that. And if he does bleed out here, if Minerva didn't save us, we would just be dead, dead, truly just dead, 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 right? Stop! This was actually quite the hypocritical act. Only moments ago, she had just scolded Subaru for putting his own life on the line for what he desired. Yet, here she was doing the exact same thing. Disregarding her own existence so that she could take care of the conflict happening in front of her. Deepon deemed these actions to be sinful, which is why Minerva's arm began to shatter upon impact. When Satella began to tell him that he needed to start saving himself, her words reminded him of the vow that he once made to Rem. He began to wonder what Rem would think if she saw him as he was now. But that wasn't an actual vow, right? That's just a little promise. But that was a very dangerous thought to entertain. If he did, then it would directly oppose the belief that he could use his life as an expendable commodity. A belief that birthed from the idea that he simply wasn't a person that would be missed. When it came to the overall picture, Subaru saw his life as worthless. Has there been a moment before this that made him realize that other people could like him? I think that Otto moment was like when he started laughing at himself because he could never even perceive. Meaning, yeah, there has never been. Even with the trial and like overcoming his like, not, it's not overcoming anything. It's just like closure with mom and dad and learning about how he can overcome his like neatness. But it's not, but the self-perception of like how you think that other people could enjoy you rather than everyone, because like he never even thinks about that, right? So it's only been Rem and Otto, and even now, Roto still has to like remind him that, bro, like you have friends, man. So I guess like everything does make sense of how he could never perceive anyone to ever like him due to his past. But was that a way of thinking that Rem would really be okay with? Subaru wasn't really sure. As his mind faded into the darkness and the voices of those closest to him began to ring in his ears, many more thoughts began to flood Subaru's head. He began to wonder if the people he was hearing would actually be sad about his death. Would they actually miss him if he left them behind? Yes. Was his life worth enough to them to make them feel some sort of distress about it? Subaru didn't know. So... Some people might feel happy during the second trial. You know what I mean? Some people genuinely might feel happy that other people grieved over your loss. To see these different timelines where you die. You know what I'm talking about? It's kind of like an ego thing where it's like, oh, they did care about me. But Subaru just felt immense guilt, right? He's like, oh my god, I cannot believe this happened. I can't believe everyone has to suffer because of me. He wondered some more. Was it okay for him to think in such a conceited manner? Was it okay for someone like him to believe that other people needed him? Was he special enough to others to make them want to reach out their hand to save him? These were the thoughts that Subaru was now considering. In that sense, Subaru is not a narcissist. I guess he's the exact opposite. Is he an exact opposite of a narcissist? No, 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 no. That's, that's extremes. But if you had that ego, of narcissism, some level of, I don't know, if you have that, it, it's, it's weird because he's very prideful, but at the same time, he can't ever expect other people to like him. It doesn't mean that prideful people can't feel that way, but he, he could never even understand other people liking him back. He is a bully to himself. He fucking hates himself. He has the worst possible opinion of himself and doesn't allow other people to like him to the point where maybe it's like a self-punishment mechanism it's just like a path of atonement because of the person who he was wasting his life he feels that no one could possibly like him all of which eventually led him to the final conclusion that the julius moment of you truly have no pride literally states to okay this is the re-zero shit i'm talking about you can't bring that one line up 
where Subaru ditches his pride to fucking do a sand attack, and that pride in the context was a knight's chivalry pride, of like a sanctity of a duel. Before that, all of his fucking uh, gaslighting of a self-proclaimed knight, right? That's prideful behavior, right? You've never accomplished anything, you're claiming shit, you think that you're so important that you can try to save like Amelia there and, m and make a fool of yourself. I, 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 I don't think that passage is too fucking supposed to make sense in this fucking moment, but... It all stems back with his self-perception and thinking that only he needs to suffer. It's almost like a path of atonement and no one could ever like him. That's how I'm perceiving this. He's special enough to others to make them want to reach out their hand to save him. These were the thoughts that Subaru was now considering, all of which eventually led him to the final conclusion that had been in his heart all along. If it was okay for him to think that his life was valued enough by others, then Subaru wanted to be able to protect all their futures together, his included as well. So it was with that thought that Subaru was finally able to say that he didn't want to die. When he returned from the darkness and began to ask his questions out loud, Minerva was the first to respond by saying that she didn't have an answer. She did however know that Satella was one of those people that wanted him to live. Okay. Her plus all the other Wilhelm, people who grieved for Julius, him the second Felix. Trial. You see, the second trial was never intended to show Subaru the sins that came from his mistakes. They weren't supposed to make him feel responsible for the worlds that were already gone. Mm -hmm. They were simply intended to show him the grief people felt because of the results of his mistakes. And then are we supposed to feel somehow good that people grieved for us? Like like hold up, what is this? They weren't supposed to make him feel responsible for the worlds that were already gone. But he did feel responsible due to the kind of person he is. They were simply intended to show him the grief people felt because of the results of his mistakes. And through that grief, wouldn't people that... Like, the average person I think would feel somewhat relieved or somehow like... Happy. That other people would... Like... There are dudes that literally fantasize about like faking their death and seeing how other people would react to it. They want to feel some sort of connection that they never had. And, if, and, and they're like, if I remove myself and fake my death, what other people and friends and family grieve for me as that would be proof that they liked me. You know what I mean? And taking that example, most, I, I think that a lot of people may feel going through this trial that, huh, people do cherish me, you know? All these different timelines, they're all grieving, they're all sad for my death, therefore they must have likened me. But he never thought of it any way like that. That's the weird thing about this character. There's so many things where it just doesn't make sense until you try to really piece them together from his backstory of like how this character even was made. To show how people would cry for him, how they would lament over their own powerlessness to save him, how they would yearn for a future where he was still there by their side. That was the answer that Subaru should have come to, but up until he can't. Now, he he can't come to that truth because he has such a fucking pathetic perspective of himself because he's so harsh. Those were thoughts that Subaru couldn't allow. That's why he kept needing to ask if it was okay to think like that, leading to Satella's acceptance of it, like how we saw in the anime. Now, the fight that occurred while Subaru was coming to this realization was a little bit different, unlike in the anime. Daphne had actually been released from the restraints of her coffin. What? She was personally facing off against Sekhmet while the coffin was used to take Tifon hostage. Well, Tifon weaker than Daphne concerned. No, we had a tier list there. We had a, we had a tier list here where Tifon is higher than Daphne, but in this current matchup, I don't know what happened. Because it wasn't a creature capable of being judged as a sinner, that made it the optimal weapon to take on Tifon. Okay, it just literally hard counters. Even though on the tier list, Tifon is higher. In a specific individual matchup, this thing cannot be judged the sinner, therefore it wins. So, with Tifon now as Daphne's hostage, that put the strongest witch Sekhmet into a bind. Anything she would do would put Tifon's soul at risk, thus upsetting the equilibrium of Echidna's world. So, that made Sekhmet unable to act. Now, the reason for Daphne's interference actually had a lot more depth to it. There was an innate curiosity that stemmed from being able to see Subaru find a way to beat the Great Rabbit. Because both the rabbit and herself shared the exact same hunger, Daphne felt that if Subaru could find a way to wipe them out, then that would be the same thing as solving her own hunger. Really? 
What? I thought that she uses the bunnies to feed herself or some shit. Does that logic make sense? But, regardless, are we gonna beat the rabbit this arc? I'm not sure. How can we? Bait with Roswell, then nuke them all down? But we gotta do it in one go. I feel like Melly would be interesting, but how the fuck are we gonna use Melly to our advantage? Cause, and can Melly even override? Cause like, it's... Melly can probably control regular Witch Beast. I don't think that she should be able to create, like, control one of the three great Witch Beasts. I, I don't think that really makes sense. An outcome that could potentially bring satisfaction to a witch that has never been satisfied. To know such a gratifying sense of content was certainly a dream that Daphne had never been able to attain. So perhaps she could grasp a portion of it if she were to see what was essentially her own hunger be brought to an end. Okay. It was a curiosity towards the unknown that rivaled even Echidna's. She really wants us to take down the rabbit. And then after that, there's only the snake left, and if we inevitably, I'm not sure if we're going to inevitably do it, but if we took down all three, would Daphne be very proud of us? Maybe. On the other hand, we know that Carmilla had used her faceless bride to bring to light all the voices that Subaru was hearing. Not try, she saved this us again. This was because she had gained a bit of satisfaction from seeing Subaru deny Echidna in the previous episode. <laughs> she also- That's right, Carmilla was very mad at Echidna for, like, that initial bait. So now, <laughs> she, <laughs> she did this out of content for her. A bit of satisfaction from seeing Subaru deny Echidna in the previous yeah, episode. Yeah, got rejected, she bitch. She also couldn't allow Subaru to disregard the love that was standing right in front of him, referring to her actions as some sort of debt that was being repaid. In any case, Subaru now found himself at a crossroads. With both his resolve and way of doing things now shattered into pieces, he wasn't so sure what it was he should be doing anymore leading Echidna to make her request one last time. Rejected. She's still acting. After which, everything was pretty much the same. The only thing left worth noting was the veil that had disappeared from Satella's face. Yeah, and it looks just like Amelia, Amelia's voice actor. It is literally Amelia in a different outfit. Which is supposed to tell us what? That they're twins? That Amelia is Satella? No. I don't think so. That's like level one way of thinking. We know Emil is a separate person, and we know Satala is a being from the past, but the resemblance is uncanny. This wasn't something that had ever actually existed in the first place. The Satella we were seeing the entire time was the Satella that Subaru's mind had perceived. Subaru had been blocking out her face with a veil that was created from his own subconscious. Wait, what? The veil was not real. It's him and his perception because he's so scared of her and then when it goes away it's like him accepting her what tell her we were seeing the entire time was the satella that subaru's mind had perceived okay subaru had been blocking out her face with a veil that was created from his own subconscious Interesting. only after accepting satella for who she was did that veil finally disappear bringing us to the end of the witch's tea party so that was the halfway point of the episode the next half leads us into events that brings us towards the climax of the arc. Are you... No Roswell? Y y y that Hello? Are you gonna cover Roswell stuff later? Yeah, there is a part two. <laughs> Holy shit, it's a separate video for- There's two parts for the- Jesus! But rather than talk about it now and end it on a cliffhanger, I yeah. think it'd be better to save this half of the episode for a couple weeks before January. Okay. That way you can use it as a sort of recap for where we left off from today's episode. Alright. That being said, you're probably wondering what types of videos that I'm going to do next. What are you going to well, do? I know a lot of you are relatively new to the channel because of all the ReZero stuff. So, I think it's only fair to tell you that my channel's content shifts with the seasons. Over the course of the next few months, What's instead happening? of ReZero, I'll be focusing more on Danmachi and Mahoka. Not just cut content. <sighs> Lena didn't do anything wrong, but as soon as she, she showed up with the fucking parasite bullshit, dude, this show just went down to fucking garbage, but hey, it is what it is. Please go give Mr. Andy News a like on the video. Check out his channel if you haven't. What's the most important things that we learned? Here's the link, by the way. What's the most important thing that we learned in this half of the cut content? Probably the existence of two. Two different beings known as Satala and Witch of Envy, but they're the same person, but there's a personality disorder. 
a personality disorder stemming from an incompatible witch factor that she took in. Why? I don't know. But that is causing this crazy being known as the Witch of Envy and the other person known as Satala. I don't know exactly which... What witch factor? What, what witch factor could she have taken? I'm not sure. Maybe during the consumption of the six witches to enact her revenge against the world for potentially killing her loved one that was Subaru in the past. Maybe that is the process of incompatible witch factor? Right? I mean, I mean the, Annie, you said one witch... Annie, you said incompatible with witch factor, but is it possible that it, this process of consuming him to destroy the world was when everything went out of the way? I don't know. Maybe... maybe she meant to collect the witch factors and consume the witches to, like, try to save Subaru. But... It went out of control, and instead, the Witch of Envy was born. From that incompatibility, from the pursuit of trying to save him, and therefore half the world was crazy, and now... She's being blamed for everything. I, I don't know. I don't know. The other thing is, Sage Candidate. Specifically, to Subaru. Which means that... Subaru is... Potentially the sage of this generation. It's a candidate, right? It's, it's, not, it's not a specific, you know, position. It's, it's just a candidate. And a candidate should notice. And does that mean previous sages have also had this power? Or are they just all super smart and super is a fraud? I, I don't know, but that's very interesting, right? There's some connection with, you know... Is there something symbolic, too, with us cutting down Flugel's tree to kill the white whale? And how Subaru is also a sage candidate, because that tree was planted by the previous sage, right? Assuming the wise man Flugel is a sage. What other important things are there? Mm, that's pretty much it, I think. The really important shit is like the sage candidate stuff, as well as the Witch of Envy and Satella difference. And then the rest is just stuff that we already know about how his perception of himself is what's not allowing him to think that other people can like him, and also why he's so suffering in these trials, even though, again, I, get, I give you the example of other people maybe feeling some sort of relief or um, happiness that other people would grieve for them, because I do feel like the average person would feel that if other people grieve that to the death, that means that it's acknowledgement that they did actually care about them, but Subaru didn't, so that's very interesting. But, I don't know. That's pretty much it. I think, I think Patrash is the dragon. And Subaru is the sage, and Reinhardt is the hero. <laughs> Are we gonna seal the Witch of Envy? I don't fucking know. But that's it for me. Um, there is a part two video that I'll probably watch immediately after. And we'll get on that when the time comes.